Welcome and thank you for listening to Evangel Temple's podcast. We're glad you're here. We hope you enjoy today's sermon. So we are starting a new preaching series this morning called The Most Boring Book of the Bible. And uh, we are looking at the book of Numbers. The series is designed to be somewhat tongue-in-cheek. I know that it sounds sacrilegious to call any part of the Bible boring. Uh, Even though we don't vocalize it, there are certain sections of Scripture that we struggle with, if we were to be perfectly honest. And the book of Numbers falls into this category. Even the title of the book scares us off. I mean, come on. Numbers. Are you kidding me? Only math teachers and NASA scientists get excited about numbers. I had to take a graduate level class on statistics and it scared me to death. I was like, are you kidding me? Nobody needs this information. But as we will learn, the problem is usually not with the text of Scripture. The problem is more often than not with us in the way that we approach Scripture. So there's a lot of people that think that the Bible is boring, that it's outdated, that it makes no sense. And that's why I wanted to take a few weeks to examine the book that most people avoid, the book of Numbers. It's actually quite an amazing book as you get into it. Uh, It's part of the, the section of the Bible that we refer to as the Pentateuch. I don't know if you've ever heard that name before, but it refers to the first five books of the Bible. It comes from the Greek penta, meaning five, tukos, meaning implement, or books. So penta took five books. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy is what is often referred to as the Pentateuch. There is some debate about who was actually the author of the book of Numbers and While parts of the book were certainly edited together and added to the book at a much later date, it is most likely that Moses wrote the book of Numbers sometime at the end of the 15th century B.C. And it explains why Israel did not immediately enter into the promised land after leaving Mount Sinai. So the exodus took place. God's people were delivered from bondage. They set out into the wilderness. They met with God at Mount Sinai. God gave them the law or the Ten Commandments. And his will for their lives was that they would immediately move to take possession of the land that God promised them. The book of Numbers details why that did not happen. And so that is what we are going to be looking at an entire generation lost out on what God had in store and they were not allowed to enter the promised land. Their problem was very simple. They were slow to obey and they were quick to complain. Now, God's plan was still accomplished, and that is critical for you and I to understand because God's plan will always be accomplished. God just used a new generation in order to accomplish it. And so you and I, in our obstinance, cannot thwart the plan of God. We can simply remove ourselves from being a part of it. And that's what we learn through the book of Numbers. Today, we face a similar situation. We have been miraculously delivered from bondage and have met with God. Amen? His plan for us is to take possession of the land He promised us. Now, this is not the language of a crusade. We are not talking about warring in the physical. What we are talking about is that God wants His message of love and grace and salvation in Jesus Christ to be known to all people, amen, and to become a reality for people. 
That's the promised land that he called us into. And it happens here in our neighborhoods, around our communities, and around the world if we allow God to do it. Too often, though, we find ourselves slow to obey and quick to complain. And so we risk missing out on God's blessing just like Israel did. Okay, since we are covering a book with 36 chapters in three weeks, we won't be looking at a single text, but we're going to examine the themes that emerge in each of the sections of the book of Numbers. So we're also going to be using a football theme as we look at this because it's November. It's the, it's the prime football season, whether that be high school, college, or the pros. I mean, we're getting into the meat of the football season. So today, the theme that we're looking at is getting ready for the big game. How many of you know that when you've got a big game coming up, you just don't fall into it? There is preparation and planning that must take place or you're not going to be successful in that big game. And so today we are going to be looking at chapters 1 through the middle part of chapters 10. I encourage you this week, uh, as we have kind of set up what these themes will be, to read the first 10 chapters of the book of Numbers. That's, you know... Barely over a chapter a day. You can do it. And uh, so just add it into your devotional reading. I'm not telling you to stop what you're doing. I'm saying go ahead and and just add a chapter and a half of the book of Numbers this week and track along with us because hopefully after this morning, the first 10 chapters of the book of Numbers will make a little bit more sense to you, okay? So it'll help you. This will be a perfect time to add it in, all right? Okay, here we go with the first 10 chapters chapters of the book of Numbers. And I want to begin by talking about the practical preparations for possessing the promised land. We, if we are going to be what God is asking us to be and to do what God is asking us to do, there are some practical things that we need to understand. And we must recognize that God is concerned about the details. Numbers 1, 1 through 3. See, this is why I say the most boring book of the Bible. I said God's concerned about the details, not a single amen. I mean, just silence. People are like, man, come on. Numbers 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting on the first day of the second month in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take a census of all the congregation of the people of Israel by clans, by fathers' houses, according to the number of names, every male, head by head, from 20 years old and upward, all in Israel who are able to go to war, you and Aaron shall list them company by company. God told Moses to count the Israelite community and the following 41 verses of chapter 1 detail that census. How exciting! God says count everybody and then uses 41 verses to talk about it. You would think a summary would suffice. But not, not for God's book. God was concerned about the details. Then chapter 2 details exactly where people are supposed to set up their tents when they stop the camp. An entire chapter of scripture about who is supposed to camp where. Then chapter 3 details just one particular tribe of Israel, the Levites. The entire chapter has nothing in it except the Levites. Chapter 4 deals with the families within the tribe of Levi. And it's easy to speed read through these chapters of odd names and numbers and miss the point. And the point is, God is extraordinarily detail-oriented. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe was an early 20th century architect and considered one of the pioneering masters of modern architecture. 
And he was famous for saying, God is in the details. His point was that the more diligent we are about the seemingly insignificant things, the more we act like God. Now, this phrase has also been kind of turned around, and many have said, you may have heard, that the devil is in the details. This saying warns us that when we ignore the things that seem small or insignificant, we set ourselves up for destruction. So the, the small things matter. The insignificant things are anything but insignificant. Too many people today believe that God is only concerned with big picture things, and we forget that God is worried about the details. People choose to live how they want to live and use the excuse that God is more concerned with the spirit of the law than he is with the letter of the law. So if I want to smoke or drink or use vulgar or profane language or view pornography or tell lies or cheat on my taxes or gossip or have sex with whomever I want or skip church whenever I feel like it or choose not to read my Bible or spend my money selfishly and not purposely grow in my relationship with Christ, it's okay because God knows deep down that I really love him. And it doesn't work like that. God is concerned, yes, with the spirit of the law, but he is also concerned with the letter of the law. And hopefully by now you understand that I am probably one of the most, our least legalistic people you're going to run into. So we're not talking about that. <laughs> But we have to understand that God is concerned with the big picture and he's concerned with the details. He knows that ignoring the details will destroy the big picture. In Numbers chapter 1 verse 54, it said, Thus did the people of Israel. They did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. Numbers 2.34 says, Thus did the people of Israel. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so they camped by their standards and they set out each one in his clan according to his father's house. Did you catch it? All of those details that we speed read over in the book of Numbers, those people followed it in detail. They did it all. Why? Because God said to do it all. It was very simple. Why am I doing this? Because God said to do this. You will often hear me say that following Jesus is not about the checklist. I believe that wholeheartedly. However, it's critical that you understand that following Jesus is also not, not about the checklist. I know that's really confusing. We cannot live our spiritual lives by legalistically following a checklist. Amen? But we cannot grow in our spiritual lives without a checklist. I know that this is a paradoxical statement. When you, when you hear that, you say, those don't go together. What are we talking about? Religiously following a set of rules, no matter how good the rules are, will never bring us to inward transformation and discipleship. So I cannot follow rules to transformation. At the same time, it becomes impossible for you and I to gauge our spiritual transformation and discipleship without a standard by which we compare ourselves. So how do I know what Jesus is doing on the inside if I have no standard to judge myself against. The problem 
that we face is the question of motivation. Does that make sense? Is our motivation to do right things and not do wrong things so that we will earn a right standing with God? Or is our motivation to do the right things and stop doing the wrong things because we have been given right standing with God because of our faith in Jesus Christ? Critical difference there. This is why the checklist can be dangerous or one of the most essential elements in our lives. If the checklist is there so that we can get right standing with God, it creates the opposite effect in our life, and it leads us to a legalistic departure from grace. But if the checklist is there so that we can keep coming back to it, to see how am I doing in terms of righteousness and holiness and my standard of living lining up with what Jesus says, then it sets us free to live in the grace of God. Because I am not striving to do good things and striving to stop doing bad things. I am leaning into the grace and power of Jesus and then it becomes evidence in my life that I'm in relationship with Jesus because I'm not doing things I shouldn't do and I am doing things I should do. John 14, verses 15 through 17, Jesus said this, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Catch the progression of what Jesus is saying. It's so critical. Notice that he doesn't say, If you obey my commandments, you will eventually love me, and then I will give you the Spirit who will be with you. Jesus says this, if you love me, then from that place of secure love, you will obey the commandments that I have for you, and... I will give you the Holy Spirit to continually empower you to keep doing what it is that you're doing. Such a critical difference there, friends. If you are working to secure the love of Jesus, you're going to work for a long time and never get where you hope to go. But if you will recognize that He loves you already. And enter into a relationship with Him, then from that love, He empowers you to live the life that you're wanting to live. So we also have to recognize that God has a special place for everyone in His kingdom. Numbers 2, 1 and 2 says, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, The people of Israel shall camp each by his own standard with the banners of their father's house. They shall camp facing the tent of meeting on every side. It is incredible to think that God would use an entire chapter of Scripture just to chronicle where people were supposed to set up their tents around his tabernacle. Now think about that. That is the entire chapter 2 of the book of Numbers. God saying where people should set up a tent. Again, no one is breaking out in a Jericho march over where we are supposed to be setting up tents. Why? Because we miss out on what's going on here. It's easy to read chapters 2 through 4 of the book of Numbers and think that only the Levites had a role to play in serving God since there's so much attention that's given to their service. However, we cannot miss the point that God strategically positioned every person in the nation of Israel exactly where He wanted them. There wasn't a single person who was left out of God's 
divine placement. What if, what if Judah had taken their 74,600 fighting men and camped on the south side of the tabernacle instead of the east side where God wanted them? What if, what if Asher had camped their 41,500 fighting men on the west side instead of the north side where God wanted them? What if Ephraim and Reuben decided they wanted to do their own thing? You see, God had a special place for everyone, and if the people of God were going to succeed, they had to be where God wanted them to be. Edward Everett Hale said this, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And what I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I shall do. You have direction from God of where you should be. Just like He said, this tribe right here, He's saying to you, you right here. This is where I want you. And it's important that you get there. As we talk about preparing to take possession of the land, using the language of getting ready for the big game, it helps us to kind of understand American football is one of the great team sports. I say American football because I lived enough out of the U.S. to know that football is not football anywhere but here. Football everywhere else is soccer. You're just running for 90 minutes. It's, it's like um, cross-country track with a ball. But the rest of the world loves it, and they get into it. And so if you love soccer, God bless you. But American football gives us this idea, because if you watch American football, even if you've never played American football, then you understand that on Every single play, there are 11 players, each with a unique and individual assignment that must do their assignment in order for the team to be successful. If you rolled out 11 of the fastest guys on the field, they would be destroyed. If you rolled out 11 of those big, gigantic offensive linemen, they would be destroyed. It takes all of them operating in their position based upon their skill set, fulfilling their assignment in order for the team to be successful. So why did God say Judah needs to be over here and uh, Nephtili needs to be over here? Because it requires all of us to be where God wants us to be according to our gifts and our abilities, fulfilling our assignment for the team to be successful. And I promise you this, your assignment is not to be in the stands watching other people participate. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 20, Paul says this, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, All were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. God has a specific role for you to fulfill 
within his kingdom that's designed for only you. You say, well, I can't play the piano and sing like Pastor Jody. Well, you can. Hallelujah. That she's where she's at doing what she's doing. Amen? What have you been naturally gifted by the Spirit of God to do? Because there's just as much anointing to teach preschoolers the fundamental principles of God's Word as there is to stand on this platform and declare the word of God or lead other people into worship. We are all to be strategically positioned by God so that his kingdom wins. Amen? Not my kingdom, not your kingdom, his kingdom. So we also need to understand the spiritual preparations for possessing the promised land. If there are practical things, then of course they're going to be spiritual things. We have to understand the necessity of purity and being separated to God. Numbers 5, verse 1 through 4, says that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, command the people of Israel that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous or has a discharge and everyone who is unclean uh, through contact with the dead. You shall put out both male and female, putting them outside the camp that they may not defile their camp in the midst of which I dwell. And the people of Israel did so and put them outside the camp as the Lord said to Moses. So the people of Israel did. And the Lord spoke to Moses, this is number 6, verse 1 through 4, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, uh, When either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink, and shall not drink any juice of grapes or eat grapes fresh or dried. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine, not even the seeds or the skins. And passages of Scripture like Numbers 5 and 6 are challenging to be understood in a modern context. Why did God tell people who had a skin disease or had touched a dead body to stay outside the camp? Why would God tell people who wanted to dedicate themselves to him that they would have to live according to a higher standard? These are things that we don't really deal with in our modern world. Last year, year and a half or so ago, I had to go see a dermatologist because I had something happening to my face. And the dermatologist took a medical history and he said, have you traveled outside of the country? And I was like, yeah. And he said, well, where have you been lately? And I said, well, I've, uh, I've been to India, and I've been to um, Vietnam, and uh, I've been to Thailand, and uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur, I've been there, and uh, uh, just like really recently. And he said, oh, he said, well, I can't rule out leprosy. That's not what you want to hear from your dermatologist. Is I thought, but could you please? Just, just rule it out. And um, I was not worried about having to go outside the camp, but I'm telling you, if you think that my family still doesn't give me grief about being potentially leprous, you would be wrong. Because, oh, I get to hear about leprosy. Now, hallelujah, I did not, in fact, have leprosy. Um, But we live in a different time. Because let's say, for the sake of argument, that I had. I would not have to distance myself from the people of God. I would not have to do any of that because we have medical treatments and we have things like that. So what is God's concern when he's talking about this? He's concerned about holiness He's concerned about purity. He's concerned that those who dedicate themselves to God decide that they are going to live up to a standard that evidences that dedication to God. If you were to sum up the theme of the book of Numbers in one word, it would be holiness. That's what's really amazing. We don't like to talk a lot about holiness, but this is what God is calling people 
to. God wants us to be completely aware of how easily we can be corrupted by sin. He wants us to understand that dedication to Him is more than simple words. So why were people forced to leave the camp? Well, from a practical standpoint, because they didn't need infectious diseases to spread through the camp, which we don't have to worry about, hallelujah, in the world that we live in. But as an analogy, God would not allow impurity to spread through the camp. And so we see this over and over and over again. How does that apply to those of us who are in a new covenant community? Well, it's amazing that John talks about that. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 10, he says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he, speaking of Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning, look at this, has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. I love when the Bible is crystal clear. And here's the thing. This is not a guilt or condemnation word. This is a way for self-reflection or to understand where other people are coming from. Because the Apostle John says this. If you are in the practice of regularly sinning, You have not known Jesus. You're not in relationship with Jesus. It's just that simple. We're not talking about, oh, I slipped up. We're not talking about, I had no intention to do this, but I did it. We're talking about, if you continue to practice sin, it is evidence that you are not in a relationship with Jesus. This is not a bunch of free grace. We're saved by grace. We can do whatever we want. There is no sin in Jesus, and if Jesus is in you and you are in Jesus, then there should be no sin in you. Amen? So, if we see continual sin, it speaks to a relational problem. It says, clearly, I am not in as good of a relationship with Jesus as I thought I was. And the evidence is all of this sin. So this is not a guilt or a condemnation. Because we notice in this what sinners do. They sin. This is just a statement of fact. You and I do not possess the ability, the power in ourselves to break away from sin. So what is the solution? Jesus. Because there is no sin in Him when I know Him and in relationship with Him and He is in me, abiding in me and I abiding in Him, now there's no sin in me because it can't be. So again, it's not my striving 
that brings about holiness and righteousness. It's my surrender to Jesus that brings about holiness and righteousness. So if I still have sin, it's not a question of my willpower. It's a question of my surrender. If I still find myself in sin, it means that it's not that I don't have enough willpower to stop. It's that I'm too willful to surrender myself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and allow Him to eradicate sin from me. We also have to understand the power of living with an open hand. Number 7, verse 10 and 11. It says, And the chiefs offered offerings to the dedication of the altar on the day it was anointed. And the chiefs offered their offering before the altar. And the Lord said to Moses, They shall offer their offerings, one chief each day, for the dedication of the altar. Now, I know we're talking about football season. This is not talking about a particular football team. Um. These are the heads over families. The, these are heads over clans and uh, people within the nation of Israel. They are the chief over this particular clan. Numbers 8.11 says, And Aaron shall offer the Levites. Look at this. Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord as a wave offering from the people of Israel that they may do service to the Lord. There are 89 verses in chapter 7, most of which give exact details of offerings. And in fact, the details about the offering repeats itself 12 times. So it's not just like it's different. It's literally this tribe did this, and then the exact words are used again for the next tribe. Again, you would think that God could summarize all 12 tribes. But he didn't. Why? Because God is trying to help us understand that we are all responsible for the support of the ministry. Every tribe was necessary, and each of us is necessary. Chapter 8 describes the offering of the Levites, not their money, but themselves. Why does God highlight the role of the Levites? Because God is trying to help us understand that open-handed living goes beyond giving money. If I'm really an open-handed Christian, it means that I give myself as well. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not lay up for yourself treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. All right, last thing is that we have to remember the power of our redemption. In Numbers chapter 1, verse 1 through 5, Moses talks about the Passover that's going to be celebrated. This is basically one year from the Exodus, if you're wondering about a timeline. It's been about a year since they have been set free from bondage. They're getting ready for the first anniversary of the Passover. The Passover was part of the ten plagues that God used to deliver, Egypt, or deliver Israel from Egypt. Um, the family had to sacrifice a lamb, put the blood of the lamb over their doorposts. When the death angel came into the territory, he passed over the homes of those that were under the blood. And it became a lasting ordinance and a festival within the community of God's people for one reason and one reason only, that they would remember the price of their redemption. That they would understand that they were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That they had experienced forgiveness and freedom because they were under the blood. And it was to be an ongoing, regular part of their lives. That they understood my redemption is not in the things I do, the things I say, the places I go. My redemption is in the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundations of the world to pardon and forgive my sin. 
I am redeemed only so long as I remain under the blood of the new covenant. Ellis Crum wrote an amazing hymn. He said this, He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. And friends, when you, every moment of your life, remember that you have been redeemed by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it makes you a different person. Hebrews 9, 14. The author of Hebrews is talking about the necessity of blood. And he talks about the inadequacy of the blood of a bull or a goat. But then he says this, How much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It is the blood of Jesus that purifies you. It is the blood of Jesus that removes the guilty conscience so that you don't have to question, am I in this thing, am I not in this thing? Am I doing it the right way? Am I doing it the wrong way? It's the blood of Jesus that sets you free from all of that. Because you can look to your life and know that if it is under the blood, then you're all right. You're all right. And whatever hell chooses to throw at you, you simply point back to the blood that has redeemed you. That's what we see going on among this people. God has plans for us and desires that you and I would take possession of the land that He has given us. But we have to make sure that we are prepared in every way. We hope you enjoyed listening to our podcast. For more information, you can find us at evangeltemple.life or check us out on social media under Evangel Temple Assembly of God. We hope you have a great week.